This is a 265 square metre home that's been designed for two families to live in. Coming up, we'll take a look at a time lapse of the build, we'll examine the floor plan in detail, and we'll break down the building process start to finish. Stick around to the end of the video for a tour of the completed home and our sit down chat with our clients. So I first met the clients in 2019. They came and talked to me about their goal to build one home that suited two families. I really like the idea of building a home for two families under one roof and helped them with the next steps of going through design. To kick off the design process, one of the very first things we had to do is a topographical survey of the land. This is an example of a topographical survey here and it shows you a couple of things. It shows you where the boundaries are but it then shows you heights of the road, heights of the build platform, there's a stream running through the back here. This is really important to get things like floor levels in relation to floodplains or the road correct. If you're building in an urban area these topos can also help you with sunlight planes, build shading, working out where the sun's going, all those important things. On this site here, they had lots of land. The main thing we wanted to do is find an optimum spot to build. As you can see from the site plan here, our clients have a rather large section. The build is going here and we're accessing it from here. As well as getting a topographical survey, we need to get a engineer's report on the land we're building upon. This tells us if there is good load bearing capacity and if not, we come up with a plan for what to do. On this site here, we had to scrape up to a metre of dirt and replace it with compacted base course. We also had to lay down a geogrid cloth and drainage coil to send any water that may accumulate under the foundation away from the build platform. Because this site was in a rural area, it's what we call off the grid, off town supply. So as part of the build, we are installing water tanks and its own septic system. But none of this stuff was there yet. So we set up a temporary water supply that we can use for things such as pouring concrete, cleaning up. Some of the other difficulties of building rural include for cell phone service, the remote access, and we also used a generator for the majority of this build until we could connect the house to the grid. These are just extra things you need to be aware of when you're building on a semi-rural site. Once we would prepared this area and the engineer had inspected it, we are able to crack on with our traditional concrete foundation. As you can see here, we did a rib raft slab where we use these polystyrene pods and channels of steel. Now that we've got a slab down, we can crack on with standing frames. We use pre-nail frames for most of our jobs. They come from the factory in packs and we lay them out. It's a bit like putting a Lego set together. We then go and bolt them down to the concrete slab. We also go around and make sure that the top of the frames are tied to the studs and the studs are tied to the bottom plates. You're making sure the whole thing sticks together. This is the first time we get a true look at how the finished house is going to feel. We can walk around the rooms and see how each space interacts with the other. This is the perfect time to look at the floor plan. One of the positives of having a large rural site is that we could do all of this on one level, all of this under one roof line. That definitely streamlines the build process. In the centre of the house here is a large double garage. Over to the south side of the garage is a smaller 55 square metre granny flat and over to the north of the garage is the younger family's four bedroom home. On the kids side here coming through the front door we have a study nook area here and then on the northern side of the building we have a large 
kitchen dining lounge with a separate media room and that steps out onto a huge north facing deck, fire in the corner here for winter and walk through pantry at the back of the kitchen here. Down the hallway here we have three kids bedrooms all the same size and a main bathroom and then in the back corner here master walk-in wardrobe and ensuite. Over on the parent side here come through the front door and you have a studio size kitchen and dining room lounge. Again a fireplace in the corner, two bedrooms one of them with a large walk-in wardrobe and a main bathroom and the parents have a deck out here. There is access internally however the intention is that this door here will be shut off and this acts like a separate unit. And over here on the south side of the screen we have the subscribe button. Go ahead, click that, help us build our channel. So frames are up, next thing we do is start the roof trusses. We lay those out again according to the plan from the pre-nailer. And one of the biggest things we need to do is make sure that the roof trusses are connected to the frames and now the whole building is tied together. This prevents it from uplift or being blown away in huge gusts of wind. After trusses we do purlins and roof straps and then we can crack on with roofing sheets. Here in New Zealand we use corrugated metal for most of our roofs and you can see this going on right now. All these lines here are hips, all these lines here are valleys, so nothing too crazy for our roofing crew and they smash it out in a couple of days. The perimeter of the build also has metal fascia and spouting. All of the water that this roof catches will get sent to the 50,000 litres of water tanks on site. And those water tanks will then be the property's main water supply, as well as all of the water for their showers and bathrooms. It'll also run through a filter and be their drinking water. Building paper is the very first thing we put on top of the frames and it serves as a line of defense and delineates what we're doing internally, such as insulation and plumbing and wiring, and what we're doing externally, such as cavity battens, weatherboard, flashings. If any moisture does make its way through the cladding, the building paper would be your last line of defense. So it does have a waterproof quality to prevent this, but you want to make sure that your cladding is doing its job properly. In this detail here you can see these are the bolts we talk about that tie the frames into the slab and this dash line here is the wall underlay. You then have a 20mm cavity batten and then you have your weatherboard. At the bottom of that we put what's called a cavity closer and this has a vent on it that allows for the cavity to breathe and anything to escape but the main job of the cavity closer is to stop any vermin, field mice, insects growing up into the cavity. Anywhere that timber touches concrete, we need to put what's called a damp proof course and that stops any moisture in the concrete rising into the timber and being held in the timber and the timber deteriorating quickly than it should. You can see these squiggly lines here denote the insulation that will go in between the studs. On the inside here we have a 10mm interior lining with a skirting. Also it's really important to note the cladding here must go down 50mm lower than the internal floor height and that any unpaved ground must be 225mm lower than the internal finished floor height. All of these small but important details mean that we're keeping moisture out which is keeping the inside of the building warm and dry. So the roof is on and now we can crack on with cladding. You can see here we've used a combination of linear weatherboard running horizontal and linear oblique weatherboard running vertical. On these elevations here as well as the cladding you can see how the building is going to look and feel. We've got the windows where they are opening, which way the sliding doors are going and even down to where we're putting the hot water unit, the infinity goes there and also things like downpipe locations.
Now that the cladding's gone on the outside of the building, we have reached the stage called closed in. This is where we move inside and we start doing things like plumbing, electrical wires, insulation, and then we put interior linings on the wall, we plaster, we do our trim, which is all of the skirtings and architraves, and we paint the walls. Now we can crack on with all of the fun details, like your one-off designed kitchen and your flooring choices and you start to really see it go from a building site into a home. You get to see a look and a feel for the colours and the choices the client has made all starting to come together. We'll do driveways, decks, fences, even planting and grass seed. All the little things that change it from a building site into a family home. If you haven't already, go ahead and click subscribe and check out what we're building in the Maymorn Farm development for similar style houses and living. Let's take a look around at the finished home and have a chat to our client, Jamie, to see how she found the building process. Hey, I'm here with Jamie and we have recently completed her family home and we've had the privilege this morning of coming in and seeing it all dressed and complete and it's so cool to see it go from being a house to a home. Let's have a chat with Jamie about the building process and her takeaways. There was a plan right from the start from Josh and the team and we already knew a lot of what we wanted anyway so I think that helped. We already knew what colours we wanted and stuff like that so I think it all just flowed really easily. Were you surprised at some of the decisions you needed to make at planning stage such as the fireplace? Yeah, yeah I didn't really think that yeah that would need to be chosen so soon but also Shane and I are super similar so we know what we want. It's kind of nice locking in some of the stuff early as well eh? then you right decision made move on what's the next thing I need to do? Yeah yeah and it was cool when we kind of got to the point of feeling like everything had been decided so now it was like what did we pick again and then we see it installed and it's like oh cool that yeah that is cool <laughs> yeah we also had to take out a meter of soil and replace it with base course did those kind of things freak you out at the time no no i just i guess we just trusted you and your opinions and recommendations and i guess we i think you're always a bit nervous about like the price at the end of the day but um again that you know at the end of the day we were pleasantly surprised with that too so everything yeah. worked out. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone about to embark on the like purchasing a piece of land or designing a home? Um, just due diligence like always um, especially particularly with land and yeah I think do your homework and companies that you want to use. I just think having someone really organized is super helpful especially for someone like me who's also super organized I didn't feel like I had to oversee stuff. Well we really appreciate you letting us build your dream home 
and you should be proud of what you've achieved here. It's amazing and beautiful and you uh, have a great spot. I'm very envious of the outlook. It's pretty cool. Um, thank you. Thank you for our home. It's amazing. You're very welcome. <laughs> It's so cool to see our clients move in and recently have a wedding in the front yard. Congratulations guys, I'm so stoked for you and it was a privilege to be a part of this process and I hope that we have made it a lasting memory for you.